ladies and gentlemen, Lord Starlet. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Barry, for those uh, very kind, I'm quite sure, undeserved uh, words. Um, somebody said to me, I see you speaking at the Douche Group next Saturday. Yes, I said, I am. Oh, he said, I see you've got the graveyard slot. <laughs> that, that boosted my confidence no end. <laughs> but however, here I am um, in the graveyard uh, slot, and of course preceded by most eloquent and expert speakers, including a member of the other place. Um, and the first thing I really must do, and Barry is quite right, um, it may be the 20th anniversary of, of, of the Blues Group in 2012, but it's the 50th anniversary, I think, of my first speech, um, which I made in the Newbury constituency when I was a Labour candidate. Now, that is a long time ago, <laughs> but I still remember it well. Uh, but the first thing really I'd like to do is to congratulate Mark Beckless and his colleagues uh, on their victory uh, over the European Union budget. That really was a very important victory and the first we've really had over the EU. And I really do congratulate him uh, and his colleagues and indeed on the other work that, they, that, that they've been doing. Uh, which is very important indeed in the House of Commons. The House of Commons has been too silent on the matter of the European Union. Um, it's been too frightened to say no to things in the trade of from the uh, European Union. And I'm very proud of the fact uh, that they kicked over the traces, if I can put it that way. Um, was it last week? Time goes very fast when you're old. Um, uh, so, I, I really must congratulate them on it. Now, the uh, prim, Prime Minister will have to heed um, what Parliament says, although it's quite clear, unfortunately, that he doesn't believe uh, that he can get a cut. And that's what Parliament said, that he should yes. get, and he should do everything in his power to get a cut in the European budget because it's burgeoning at a very, very fast rate and has to be stopped. Um, and the other thing, of course, which happened was this, that the Prime Minister was put on notice that he has to listen to his own people as well as the Liberals. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And he hasn't been doing that um, enough since he became Prime Minister. And I think it's put him on notice yeah. that the Tory party now um, is a different sort of party and it's not going to take everything that the EU does and says for granted. Um, and <laughs> and of course the other thing that he's got to be very careful about is that, and he should already have known it, and that is that the Labour Party will exploit everything they possibly can, including going back on everything they believed yep. in, and <laughs> to get at the government and undermine the Prime Minister. He needs to take that lesson into account. Um, but Prime Minister, Prime Ministers are very peculiar people. And um, as Mark said, this all started way back, and the first Prime Minister, really, who set the um, common market and EU port going, was, of course, Harold Macmillan. Now, Harold Macmillan uh, said two things. One, Britain is ungovernable. What a thing for a Prime Minister to say. Britain is ungovernable. And the second was that the country needs the chill wind of competition from Europe. And by God, have we had a chill wind? Yeah. And 
it's grown coal, and it's done this country very much harm indeed. So that was Macmillan. And then, of course, there was Mr. Heath. <coughs> Mr. Heath, um, who promised in the 1970 election that he would negotiate on the common market, as it was then called, no more and no less. And then he reneged on that promise and brought forward a bill. And before he brought forward the bill, in 1971, he produced a white paper in which he said that Britain's sovereignty was safe. Do you remember that? Yes. There was no essential loss of sovereignty. By heaven. Um, he's dead now. Um, uh, but uh, uh, we've lost at least 50% of our sovereignty. And that uh, uh, the figure that might be higher than that. And then, of course, there was Bruce. Harold Bruce. Labour Party was then against the common market, against going in, um, the, the party voted against going in, uh, remained uh, against uh, being in, and wanted to come out. And what did Wilson do? He said, I'll go to Europe and I'll renegotiate the whole thing. <laughs> and, I mean, you all recognize that phrase, don't you? Yes. Renegotiate. And he came back and he said, I've rene renegotiated it now and therefore we can stay in. So against his party, his government, the Labour government, recommended to the people of the country uh, that they should stay in. So he actually put the government against his party. So that was Wilson. And I remember it well because in actual fact, and um, he called a meeting, after the cabinet agreed, he called a meeting of all other ministers. And of course I was a minister, because I was a government whip. And we were all there, lined up, um, uh, in the cabinet room. Uh, cabinet, yes, I think it was the cabinet room, but it was somewhere in 10 Downing Street. Um, and uh, one by one, all the junior ministers got up and made devastating criticism of the government. And they were so surprised. And by the time the 10th one had gone up, they said, well, sorry, we've got another meeting. So they closed the meeting. And that was the end. But in actual fact, the, real, the whole of the government, the Labour government, taken in total them with the cabinet ministers and, and the junior ministers, were against the government. But they still recommended uh, that we should remain in. And of course, uh, Wilson, in the government's uh, uh, publication, said we had one great victory. We have negotiated away the possibility of economic and monetary union. Now we know that wasn't right, really, because we got it, and by heaven, how we got it. And, and uh, then, of course, uh, after um, after that Labour government uh, came uh, Margaret Thatcher, but I'll come back to her in a minute. But then there was Blair. Um, no, no, I'm wrong. No, 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 I'm wrong. I'm, I'm completely wrong. I've forgotten. Uh, um, who is it now? Um, what's his name? Tell me his name. Are you teasing us, David? <laughs> well, you know, you know who I mean. And uh, he's still around, um, and uh, he's still making speeches. But the fact of the matter is that he, again, turned on the people in his party uh, who were uh, doubtful about the Maastricht Treaty. The Maastricht Treaty. And you will also recall, I'm sure, that Douglas Hearn, the then uh, Foreign Secretary, said of the treaty, now that I've signed it, perhaps I'd better read it. <laughs> and that's the way that things are done. Yeah. Not just the Tories, it's uh, all of them. And then, of course, there was Mr. Blair. 
Mr. Blair, who in March 1997, March 1997, said in the sun, I am a British patriot. <laughs> My God. Ever, but ever since then, he gave away more of our sovereignty than ever before. Yeah. And indeed, he led the campaign to get us into the Euro. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, people like you, and people like me, if I might say yes. so, um, beat him yeah. and won the battle. And just think what the, what the situation would be now if we hadn't <coughs> won that battle and we were in the EU. But anyway, all his red lines went to pot uh, and we got the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, I'm not going to deal with the present Prime Minister because I think Ian Milne did that very well earlier uh, today. But I do want to go back to Lady Thatcher because, of course, she was the Prime Minister who, having been misled yeah. by her advisers, saw the light. Yeah. Saw the light. That was important in itself. But what was even more important was that she had the courage to do something about it. Yeah. 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 to go to Bruges, of all places, yeah. Bruges, and say that what was happening was wrong and that we were not going to have it. That in fact Britain was going to remain an independent country. And she also had the courage to go to the House of Commons and say, no, no, no. And then what happened? That's right. They got rid of it. Um, a conspiracy took place, and uh, in my view, you'll, you'll find it a bit surprising to hear me say this, uh, one of the best Prime Ministers of the uh, 20th century uh, was kicked ignominiously out of office. And the, the Tory party ought to be damn well ashamed of them. Yes. say that I've always been against the common market, call it what you will, certainly the EU. I, as I've said, I made my first speech uh, against going into the common market um, and have opposed every other, uh, every, every other treaty uh, since then, either in the House of Commons or the House of Lords. And of course, I still believe whatever anybody else says, that the only way is out. Yeah. There are no half measures. You're either in or you're out. And until you're out, you cannot reform um, what our country has become. So I'm an unashamed uh, come out. Um, and, you know, at one time, when I was opposing, you know, in the 70s, uh, 60s and 70s, I was accused of being a left winger, a, a lefty, a Benite. <laughs> you know, that's what we were then, those of us uh, who opposed going into the common market. Now I find that I'm supposed to be on the extreme right. <laughs> because I want to come out. But I've always wanted, never wanted to be in, always wanted to come out. So I've remained exactly where I am, but I've gone from extreme left to extreme right without doing anything other than standing still. <laughs> but you know, seriously, the issue um, is, is not about party politics. The issue transcends party politics. And the issue is who governs Britain. And I believe that the people who should govern Britain are the British. You know, people might be surprised to hear me say that. 
But the fact of the matter is that the only people who can govern Britain properly are the British themselves, untrammeled by any other uh, people. Now, you cannot be in the EU and not governed by it, governed by it, yeah. or run by it. That is the Conservative Party policy at the moment. Mark, that has to be altered. <laughs> yes. Because you can't be in the EU and not be run by it. And I thank you for all you're doing, yeah. and your yeah. colleagues as well. I thank you uh, again. Um, because everything that is done, the whole direction, of Europe is for a single unitary state, a centralized state. Don't make any mistake about it. That's what the plan is. And every crisis which blows up is used towards ever greater unity. That's what they do, and that's what happens. Um, and uh, we simply cannot go along with that. It doesn't matter what other people say. And Angela Merkel said to the European Parliament the other day, let's just have a little quote. Uh, the EU Commission will eventually become a government, the Council um, of Member States, an upper chamber, and the European Parliament more powerful. Oh, yeah. Now that's what she said. That's what she said to the MEP. Um, and what she said to, was, to Britain was, of course, if you leave the EU, you will be alone. <laughs> I find that not only disgraceful, I find it offensive. Yes. There was a time when this country stood alone. Yeah. And thank God it did. Yeah. Otherwise, Germany and the rest of Europe, at least, would be governed by the Nazis. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's why I find her remarks um, offensive. Um, and uh, it, it, indeed, I'm surprised that um, she made uh, such, an, such a remark as that. Um, to begin with, never mind about the last call, um, uh, one could go into that in great detail, particularly uh, on this particular day, on the eve of Armistice Day, but I, I, I won't do that. Um, but what I do want to say is that Frau Merkel should remember that this is a country of over 60 million people. It has built up a great, a great empire. It, was, it built up the Industrial Revolution and it dissolved peacefully its great empire as well. And um, she might also bear in mind that we won't be alone. There's a wide, wide world outside there. Mm. And we also have the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. She forgot the Commonwealth. And the Commonwealth represents a quarter of the world's population. How could we possibly be alone? with a commonwealth like that. And why don't we develop the commonwealth? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, there are, of course, the unifiers. Um, they're still there. Don't make any mistake about it. Blair still wants to go into the euro. He still wants to go into the euro. Um, so they're still there. Um, and. Uh, these are the people who call people like you and me swivel-eyed little Englanders, closet <laughs> racists, gadflies, and the like. We are the people who are going to save Britain. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's why the little... Uh, I'm Welsh, so it's difficult <laughs> to describe me as a little Englander, but nevertheless, uh, the Welsh are little Englanders, as little Englanders in this... Uh, uh, sense uh, uh, as well. Um, now, um, the, it is the opponents, in actual fact, um, of uh, the 
uh, of the EU that saved us from being in the EU, you know, as I uh, already yeah. said. Um, and it really is tragically right that we did so. Because what is happening um, in the EU, in the Eurozone, there's burgeoning unemployment, mm -hmm. and uh, the Commission has, uh, has estimated that it will go up by a further 720,000. So all the promises are not, uh, are not being uh, uh, met. Um, there's austerity, lower living standards all over, massive debt, and rioting and protests. When I said a long time ago that there would be rioting in the streets, I was laughed at. But it's there. The fires are burning. Uh, people are being injured. People are being put in prison in Greece and elsewhere. Um, thank heaven we didn't join that Euro train that they said we should be joined. Which we should join unless we uh, were um, uh, going to be sidelined. Uh, but in spite of its failure, um, there are, as I say, Europhi Europhiles like Blair who still want us to join the uh, European train. And they deny that we're under the EU's thumb. Um, can I just, if you, if you believe that, let me just quote. Um, have I got the time? You have. Yes. Um, uh, I just want to quote from a question I asked. I, I asked 127 written questions last year on the subject. Um, but uh, I've, I've got an if I can find it, that is. Um, yes, here we are. Uh, to ask Her Majesty's Government, further to the written statement by Lord Marland on the 30th of October, concerning the Green Investment Bank. Why they needed the approval of the European Commission to commence operation of the bank, and what would have been the consequences if the Commission's approval had not been given? That's a straight question, mm -hmm. isn't it? This was the answer by Lord Gardner of Kimberley. The European Commis Commission must approve all state subsidies provided by member states. In assessing the Green Investment Bank case, the European Commission had to satisfy itself that the impact of the measure on competition in relevant markets was justified by its contribution to achieving green policy objectives. Without state aid, approval, approval, approval of the bank Without state aid approval, uh, approval, the bank would not have been cleared to start making investments. Had the bank made investments without receipt of the Commission's approvals, there would have been a high risk that the Commission would order the investments to be unwound. In other words, we not only had to ask their permission to get the Green Bank going, but if they had refused the Commission, uh, if the Commission had refused and we had still sent up, set up the Green Bank, they would have undermined it. So anybody who believes that we can be in Europe and not governed by Europe is living in Van Kuperman, I'm afraid. And that, that sort of answer, which is just uh, uh, one of many I've had, uh, just quotes it. Um, now, with regard to the single market um, and a possible uh, referendum, um, EU lovers always um, quote the benefits of a single market uh, and trade as a reason for remaining in the EU. A single market, though, implies a single government. And I think that's become quite obvious today uh, by the other speeches we've had. Why else does the EU have a government, a bureaucracy, a parliament, a currency, a fledgling army, a foreign minister, a diplomatic service, a flag, an anthem, and sticky fingers in virtually every policy pie, including taxation, foreign affairs, policing and justice, employment, health, 
energy, education, and so on. Now, um, why do you need all that for a single mind? It's nonsensical. And it shows just how far we have been uh, taken into this country, uh, which is going to be called um, Europe. Um, and of course, there's the overregulation costs. Again, we've heard about uh, those uh, earlier on uh, today. Um, and that costs uh, industry at least £10 billion pounds a year. Uh, and uh, the increasing burden of our contributions, which Mark mentioned, going up to £13 billion. Pounds. What, would we, what could we do with £13 billion pounds, um, if we didn't send it to uh, uh, the, Euro to, to the European Commission to waste uh, and to finance and subsidise our competitors? It really is quite an nonsense. Um, I believe that the United Kingdom would thrive outside the European Union and the single market. Yeah. Which, don't make any mistake, is in decline. Yeah. These, this, this market is in decline. Um, they talk about 500 million people. But you know, there are 6,500 million, thousand million uh, outside the market, uh, common market. So that uh, in a declining market, um, which doesn't represent uh, a, a very great percentage of the world population, um, outside that mark, outside, we would thrive uh, 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 and would be able to uh, make our agreements with other countries freely uh, and uh, trade with our Commonwealth, which I've mentioned before, and particularly the BRIC countries and uh, other countries. And as far as the possible, as far as a possible referendum is concerned. What we must understand is that it must be won. There's no question about it. If a referendum is held on an in or out basis and it is lost, Britain is lost. Yeah. Yeah. Because the people will have spoken, they want to remain in, and we will no longer uh, be, uh, uh, no longer be uh, an independent nation. Um, and, of course, I was around in 1975, because I was the Member of Parliament of Swindon, and fought, the, uh, fought uh, in, in the uh, referendum campaign of 1975. And it was quite clear that everything uh, was against us. The newspapers, the BBC in particular, um, uh, big business, and the amount of money which uh, uh, our opponents, the Yes campaign, had exceeded 20 million pounds. Now, I don't think it'll be the same this time, but nevertheless, uh, we have to make sure that we are going to win that referendum, because if we don't, uh, the country, as a free nation, uh, has no future. Um, I believe that free of the hated CAP uh, British agriculture would be able to develop in a way that suits our own country rather than a peasant French farming system. And our fishing industry, uh, which has been so depleted um, since 1973, could be revived and our waters protected from overfishing by the Spaniards and others. So I say roll on the day when we can run uh, our economy to suit our country and its people without the incubus of uh, the EU and to be governed by our own government, elected government, by our own parliament through institutions which have been built up over a thousand years uh, of history to suit our people and its democracy. <coughs>